everyone, it is Mark Sapatella from Mastering MuseScore here, and welcome to the Music Masterclass. So before I go any further, I should say for anyone wondering, no, I'm not really doing any better physically throat-wise uh, than I was yesterday in the cafe. So we're going to make the best of it. And I want to prepare you uh, for um, uh, something I'm going to do a little bit later. I want to see who wants to come on and join me on stage because we know that's a thing and I've done it occasionally. I haven't done it a whole lot lately, but you know, I can bring people up on stage and I would love to have someone, uh, more than one person, in fact, come up on stage to try their hand at some sight singing, you know, not at this very second, but you know, once we get all kind of warmed up and thinking our way through it, um, you know, Keep that in mind if uh, if you would like to be to volunteer to either to help demonstrate things or just get some feedback, you know, either way or both. Meanwhile, though, there's a couple other things that I want to focus on first uh, that I think are also valuable and um, uh, are, are things I've been wanting to demonstrate, wanting to talk about. And this, I think, today is like the perfect opportunity for it. So. Um, what, uh, what I'm going to be talking about here has to do with major scales and keys, right? That is the subject of the week and next week in, uh, the basic music theory cohort right now. And we're talking about major scales and keys and we're talking about them, you know, not just knowing your major scales, not just being able to play the things, but really getting inside them in, uh, uh, getting inside the concept a little more. And so I want to talk about this and I'm going to do a demonstration that I know a couple of you have seen before, before, but probably uh, many of you have not. And I've got a new application of this. So this is a demonstration that I do often, uh, when talking to jazz pianists. Okay. So when I'm talking to jazz pianists about learning to improvise, one of the things that I say is, you know, you're trying to translate what you hear in your head into what keys to press on the piano. And one of the things that can really help with that is if at least your hands know their way around the keyboard. And this doesn't only apply to piano, and I'll talk about that in a minute, but it applies especially to piano. So here's the demonstration that I typically do. Let's say that I've asked you to improvise in the key of C major on the piano. I can do that. I could do that all day long and never play a wrong note, right? I am improvising in C major. This is totally terrible music, but it is improvising in C major. I can do it with my eyes closed while carrying on a conversation, and I'm not playing any wrong notes. I can even get both my hands in there, right? I can do that all day long in C major, and so can you. Why? Because, well, white keys, black keys, right? As long as you don't push your fingers far enough back there, to play the black keys, you're going to be successfully improvising in C major. Now, I'm not saying that's great improvisation. Of course it's not. What I am saying is we want to get the mechanics of knowing the keys out of the way so that then you can start thinking a little more about your actual melody without the mechanics of, well, wait a minute, what notes are, is this going to be without that getting in the way? So, for anyone who is a pianist, especially if you're interested in jazz piano and improvising, but not just that, if you are a pianist of any sort, classical pianist, pop pianist, whatever we're talking about here, uh, this, what I'm about to show you, I think is a fantastic exercise. And it consists of doing essentially what I just did in all 12 keys. So that was C, you know. Here's A. I, I can do the same kind of thing of just kind of improvising. I have to look a tiny bit uh, if I'm going to jump around because it's hard to. Ooh, I almost played a D sharp. I felt that. Um, but I'm just I'm just mo moving my fingers around in the key of A because I know this key and I want to show that I can do that. D flat. We want D flat. Here's D flat. And, and again, this is not about practicing improvising. This is about practicing the keys. I almost played a G natural, kind of actually, uh, I keep accidentally uh, moving my finger onto that G. So 
this idea that we want to know the scale. We want to know the key so well that our hands just find the notes. This is, again, really important, I think, for uh, improvisers, because then if you want to actually improvise in D flat, I'm playing actual melodies, thinking about the melody, but I don't have to think about the notes that I'm playing, right? I'm not thinking about the buttons that I'm having to press and, oh my gosh, which, which note's going to sound good? I know the D flat scale because I did things like what I just did there. So the thing is that works uh, um, really well on piano because it really is what I sometimes do is talk about uh, um picturing a magic piano in your head in which, like when I was doing this in A, well, I'll, I'll just pick another key now. This time I'm gonna do B flat. What I wanna do is I'm, with my eyes closed, I'm picturing this magic piano that only has these seven notes on it over and over again. These other notes just don't even exist. And all I'm doing is just playing the notes that are there. I don't have to clutter my mind by even seeing the other notes. And the piano works really well that way because each button you either it's either in the key or not. Most other instruments aren't like that. You know, there's a given key on a saxophone and you might play that key for several different notes. And yes, Colleen, this is like something when you're improvising. Yeah, you sometimes get into not you personally, but one gets into this mode of just running scales. And I'm not advocating that I'm not advocating that we literally do this improvising, but I am saying we want to know the notes really well so that we can then be better at making melodies and not have the mechanics of being in the right key get in our way. So as I mentioned, the layout of the piano really lends itself to that because then if you know this note is either in the key or not, and I just don't play that button, I don't press that button if it's not in my key. If I'm in D flat, I'm not going to play that note. If I'm in B flat, I do play that note. A sax, like my clarinet, isn't like that. Like this key right here, this key right here is part of a lot of different notes. It's part of many different notes. So I can't just say play that key or don't play that key. Right. So there's almost no instrument other than piano in which it works in that same way. But I think it still does work. And I'm going to be putting this to the test myself. So you've seen me or heard me talk about recorder occasionally. And that, you know, I, I should tell you that, I, you know, like almost everyone, at least in the United States, I learned a uh, recorder in elementary school a little bit. It was part of our, you know, basic music training. And for whatever reason, I'm one of the ones who like kept with it. And then like, at some point I started playing in our church group, playing recorder, and I just stuck with it and just, you know, plunking up melodies, coming up with my own harmony parts and abogados and all sorts of things like that. And at some point I decided, uh, I, I don't even know how I knew it was a thing, but alto recorder. I got an alto recorder and started dealing with that. And so this isn't the one I had then, but these are uh, my two recorders now, a, a soprano recorder and alto recorder. So the thing is, on a soprano recorder, that's a C, right? And this is a C scale. So I'm just lifting my fingers one at a time, basically, to play the scale. There's a couple funny things with Baroque fingering as opposed to German fingering as far as how that goes. But on an alto recorder, that same note, all fingers down, is an F. So the same fingering that was a C scale on soprano is an F scale on alto. Now, this in itself is not that unusual in the world of wind instruments, like my clarinet here. Uh, this is a B-flat clarinet. This same scale, that same sequence of lifting up your fingers basically plays a B-flat scale on clarinet, except I'm partially lying because it either plays a B-flat or an F scale, depending on what octave you're in. Clarinets are weird. But every other wind instrument, that's C, D, E, F, G, 
A, B, C. Every single wind instrument, you know, flute has essentially that same fingering. Saxophone has essentially that same fingering. Bassoon, uh, oboe, etc. All the wind, all the woodwind instruments have some version of that same fingering. Basically, you play a C scale by lifting your fingers one at a time. And then, you know, we have different versions of things like this is a B flat clarinet, but there's also an A clarinet. And this is still, I, I read this as a C, right? When I see middle C, uh, clarinet again is weird. Uh, let's pretend this is a flute. That's middle C, right? All the all the fingers down like that. So um, on all the other instruments, saxophones and so forth, all those fingers down is your middle C. And uh, the thing is, it's not going to sound like middle C on all those instruments. On an alto saxophone, this sounds like an E flat below middle C. On a soprano saxophone, it sounds like the B flat below middle C. On the tenor saxophone, it sounds like the B flat, an octave, and a step below middle C. Most instruments, we write music for them in such a way that we can still have this illusion that we're just dealing with a C scale, and then we transpose the music as necessary to make it sound right, which is a whole subject into itself. Most instruments work that way so that you can use the same fingering no matter which instrument you're playing. For whatever reason, back in the day when people were coming up with uh, recorder music, they just didn't do that. They, they said, you know what, we're not going to transpose the music for all these different recorders. We're just going to make recorder players learn different fingerings. Now, when I was doing this in grade school, I transposed my music. I, I didn't feel like learning different fingerings. So I, I treated this as a C. I read that as a C, and I just made sure all my music was transposed. But that's not how real recorder players do it. So... I've been getting back into recorder lately, and I've decided I'm going to teach myself the real fingerings now. This is F. And so what I want to do is some version of that same exercise I just did of knowing, you know, being able to improvise. <laughs> so that was C. That was the C scale on my alto recorder. And I had to think a little bit harder than I do to play in C on piano or on a soprano recorder. But I did it. Can I do that for A? Oh, my gosh, that's going to be hard. Is that an A? Yeah. <laughs> I have to like that myself. Now I'm not, I'm not like, I'm actually thinking too much because I'm not good enough to just wiggle my fingers. And so I'm slowing down thinking about what I'm playing. But that is going to be super valuable practice, super valuable practice for me to take each key and just try to be as mindless as possible and just move my fingers through that key to really kind of get those fingers into my fingers, <laughs> get the fingerings into my fingers. And I think, yeah, that applies to cello, and I think it applies to lute. I think it applies to any instrument that if you just put your mind to thinking about where those patterns are, like on cello, where do your fingers go to play an A scale? Where are those finger positions across the fingerboard? And they're just practicing that. See, the thing is, we get into practicing scales. And practicing scales is, is okay. It helps you build technique because it moves your fingers in a particular order, and real music does have scalar passages, but that's not all there is to it. And so sometimes you'll see people give you exercises where, you know, instead of just playing, they'll say, oh, let's do two octaves. Or they'll say, hey, let's do this thing where we do Did I play that F sharp and nothing came out? Is my action going? And then there's things like the hand in exercises and then contrary motion. Oh, yeah. I'm trying to not let my recorder fall onto the ground here. But, um, yeah, so we practice these exercises like that. Practicing exercises like that does have some value because by making it be the same thing every time, you can do it faster and faster and build finger strength, build accuracy, and so forth, right? So any exercise like it 
where you're walking up triads, anything like that where you're doing a particular pattern, you can practice that over and over and build finger strength, build dexterity, build coordination, build all these things. But what I'm talking about does that to some extent, but also engages this somewhat more creative part of our brain and a little bit more of the ear training part of our brain. So when I mentioned uh, wanting to do this on recorder, one of my inspirations for this is, you know, as I was like researching records, I just later today, I'm going to be getting a new recorder. It's not a, not a big fancy one, but it's a better plastic one. My old wooden one kind of disintegrated. Um, but uh, I'm getting a better plastic one later. And I was researching about them. And there's this woman, uh, and what is her name? Sarah Jeffries. Does that sound right? I want to get her name right because she's awesome. Sarah Jeffrey. Is that right? Recorder. This is the this is her. Jer Sarah Jeffrey. Yeah. So this woman, uh, I mean, I don't know anything about her as I don't know thing about her as a musician, if she's actually considered like a particularly good recorder player, but she produced these really informative videos about recorder. And I was watching one of her videos about um, uh, about alto recorder specifically, and that question about transposing, you know, how kosher is it to just transpose your music versus actually learn the videos? And I mean, actually learn the uh, fingerings uh, for that. And she's like, yeah, recorded players do this. And she talks about her strategies for it. And uh, her strategies for it were interesting because they were very, to me, improvisatory in that she she talks about like lowing, being able to do this in like not just for CNF, but as a professional recorder player, she has G recorders and D recorders and recorders and E flat, all these different keys. And she has to learn all these different fingerings. And what she says is to some extent, she isn't really dealing with translating the note into a finger, but she's reading the intervals and kind of playing by ear, which is very much what I say improvisation is. Improv, you know, it's transposing, I say, is playing by ear in another key. And so now we're going to be morphing into talking about the sight singing thing. If I see a melody that I want to play, and let me flip over to one, if I flip over to a melody that I'm perhaps interested in playing here, uh, and I'm going to go to right where our thing starts. Yeah, I'll start with 31 here. Let's see if I make this a little wider. There we go. A little wider still. Right there. Okay. Uh, once I know, for instance, like I have to think, where is G on this instrument? You know, I, I, I want to do this because this is G on so many other instruments. But I know recorder, luckily, the alto recorder is very similar to the bottom octave of a clarinet. So I have that to rely on. But unfortunately, clarinet changes fingerings between octaves. And if I think too much about that on, on alto recorder, it messes me up because it doesn't change octaves. I mean, it doesn't change fingering. But here's a G. And therefore is also a G, but it's also fingered this way. And what I can do now is just play that melody by following its contour without even thinking about what the notes are. I was not thinking about the fact that this is a C and how do I play a C on this recorder? I know how the scale works and I'm reading the ups and downs of it. And as long as the music is mostly scalar, as so much music is, I can succeed pretty well that way. It gets trickier when we start having more skips in our melody. So if I jump to a place where they start introducing more skips, uh, here's some leaps to do. Oh, here's, yeah, so I'm gonna do some leaps to do. Here's a G and again, I gotta remember, Uh, ran out of notes. What did I do? Did I do something wrong? Is that a G? Yeah. I don't, I can't, the problem is I can't, I, 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 I ran out of notes. 
because this only goes down to an F and I don't have those notes. But so I wasn't able to do my leap to G. Where's my leap to Do? Here's a here's one with a leap to Do. All right, here's a C. Uh, what the? There we go. Um, if I know where my Do is then I can leap to it, right? And I know, so I have to remember that fingering. Yeah, I should have started up an octave on this one, but then I'm gonna do that same thing where I'm not good enough on this, I haven't been practicing enough, and my my Airstream isn't working for me very well today. It doesn't make as big a difference on clarinet, on, on recorder as it does on clarinet. On, on clarinet, Colleen, I think if you're still around, you can back me up on this. Any reed instrument, but especially clarinet, probably oboe and bassoon also, trying to play with a cold is like the worst thing ever. Like, like it's, it's like, it's hard to even explain what a miserable experience trying to play the clarinet with a cold is because you're trying to build up this certain type of pressure here. And meanwhile, the air starts wanting to come out your nose and come out the sides of your mouth and your body just does not want to do what is required to play a clarinet. And I think it's true of all wind and what woodwind instruments, or at least all reed instruments, but clarinet requires more pressure than most. And yeah, it's 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 an awful experience. So anyhow, yeah, I'm I'm fighting uh so high notes in particular are gonna be hard for me here. So um <clears throat> so anyhow this the stuff that I've been talking about with sight singing, even things that aren't a challenge for me necessarily to sing, uh, I think I'm going to be using the same book as practice on my alto recorder and not just to learn fingerings, but to be able to take these same tricks that I would use sight singing. Bam. I don't know that that's a perfect fourth. I mean, I, I know it's a perfect fourth, but that's not what enables me to sing it. It's knowing where the tonic is. Blah, 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 blah. Bam, blah, 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 Bam, blah, 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 Bam. Knowing that I can come back to the tonic at any time is what enables you to succeed in an exercise like this that's all about steps plus leaps to tonic. And there's a method to the madness here because leaps to the tonic are actually quite common. And the way he'd set it up, set it up here, leaping to a note you've just played or sang recently, leaps within a triad, there's all sorts of things like this that, you know, they relate to how music actually works and it allows you to introduce skills gradually. So that's one of the things that a good sight singing book, uh, like this one. And I'm not going to claim this Eyes and Ears is the best sight singing book ever. It's it's not. It, 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 there's a lot of things about it that I find quirky and odd. But it's it's free. It's wide. It's available to everyone. And uh, it's been used as now the basis for other things like Jim Ivey has been using it as the basis for his ear training uh, system. And other people have talked about entering the music in Muse score. I suspect Jim must have done that for part of what he's doing as well. So all right, my voice is is beginning to have had enough here. Let me let me read Allison's comment here. Uh, scales in every key, rhythmic patterns. Yeah, yeah. So this idea of working through particular patterns is powerful and it's great, especially again for building technique and so forth. But I definitely think for anyone who's trying to be a creative musician, whether that means composing or improvising or playing by ear, th this idea of connecting what you're doing to what you're hearing is powerful too. And so using improvisation-based exercises as opposed to mechanical exercises is really powerful as a way of developing that ear connection. So um, so anyhow, that's uh, what I... Uh, um, what I uh, am, am recommending here. Ooh, Moose Hill, I know, Moose Hill Canteen, I know that place, yeah, cool place. And yeah, so yeah, obviously, Margie, the well-tempered clavier is a great set of exercises. The pro so, so here's the thing with something like well-tempered clavier. These are not easy pieces. I mean, this one is. I can play the, I can play that ridiculously fast um, because it's really quite simple. But <laughs> most of those things, especially the fugues, are quite difficult to play. I mean, we're not talking, you know, it's not a Rachmaninoff concerto or something, but they're not easy pieces. They're not like 
uh, things your average person who's still learning the instrument can sight read. So one of the reasons Hannon exercises are as popular as they are, even though they're hideously boring. Um, it's just patterns like that. Um, they are possible for the average person to just sight read and start working on dexterity right away. With the preludes and fugues, um, you know, it takes a long time to learn it well enough where you can start working on dexterity. But yeah, once you get them, they are great to play. And I, the, the fugues, I mean, some of the preludes are complex, uh, but a lot of them are relatively simple compositionally uh, for Bach. But the fugues in there are every bit as complex as anything else that Bach writes in that genre. And uh, yeah, they're amazing, amazing music. I use them as examples all the time for lots of different things. In fact, we're possibly going to be using one of them as an example next week. So... <clears throat> Ooh, sight read every, through through all of them. Wow, that's impressive. Going sight reading through all. I haven't even I haven't played them through them all. I've never even played them all myself. So, what I'd like to do now is uh, transition to talking more about the singing, and I want to see who is willing to come on stage with me and uh, say um, uh, you you're you're willing to to try your hand at singing. And the idea is that way. Here's what here's what I would here's what I would want. I'd want some people to just say, "Hey, I want to try to sing this. I don't think I'm going to be very good." And then maybe I can get feedback on what I'm doing well, what I could do better, and we can you know see if we can help. But also people who feel like they are pretty decent at this to demonstrate some things. And I, I might say, "Hey, since my voice isn't going to." Uh, you know, do very well if I try to sing this one right here. I mean, maybe it'll do okay, but it's going to be really rough. I want to see, you know, if someone else will want to demonstrate these. But now is mostly whether you want to come on stage or not, we're going to be picking these and just practice singing them together. So, uh, and in the privacy of your own home, whether you're on camera or not. Before I do that, though, so I'm still waiting. I want to see someone come up in the chat and say, yes, I'm willing. If you're doing the hand raise thing, I'm not seeing it. So I should come over here, see if anyone is actually raising their hand. Uh, can I see hand raises here? But uh, yeah, it's a little awkward for me to uh, see hand raises while I'm looking at the chat. So, um, so yeah, instead... Uh, I, I just ask you to put into the chat anyone who's interested in coming on board. I mean, if no one comes on board, we'll 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 get through, and you'll just uh, you'll just hear me croaking my way through these things. But I do have to show you something pretty darn cool. So, Jim, I know you're here, and and I, I still am playing with with Anki Anki, however we're supposed to say that, and we're trying to learn more about that. And I'll uh, uh, talk to you a little bit more about that and try to get this going. But I did play with Ella a little last night. Ella is this app I mentioned uh, in one of my posts recently. It's this guy here. And I want to show you Ella. Ella does something that is technologically uh, um, amazing. It's great that this is possible. And uh, the fact that this is possible now is like, in some ways, a game changer. And let's talk about this a little more. So what it's going to do is it's going to show me a melody. And then let me sing the thing. So the thing is, I'm going to try to show you what it's doing while I'm singing it. So I can't really see it. but I, So I'm going to memorize it. <clears throat> and I'm going to press record. And then you're going to see what happens here. Check this out. Oops, no, I need to press the tonic first. So first, I press the tonic button so I can hear a C. Mm. Now check this out. Da 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 da. So, you see what it's done? It has tracked my pitch while I've sung, and it's showing me where my pitch is wavering, and it's giving me a score. My score on that is oh, that's an average score. Oh no, that eighty-five is my score. If I tap this thing. Did I sing a note wrong? Maybe I'm that. Yeah, I probably looked at. 
I sang the right notes. I don't know what it's talking about. But in any case, it gives you a score both on your intonation and on the actual note choices. And typically, I'm going to nail the note choices, but my intonation is going to be really bad. And I'm looking at this and going, well, wait a minute, this is backwards. It's giving me a better intonation score than the interval score. That's basically telling me I sang the wrong notes, but sang them in tune. No, no, that is not true. I sang the right notes, but they were way out of tune. Unless I misremembered the melody. But in any case, oh, reading. Minus one. Oh, yeah, it also takes off points because I waited too long before I started because I'm talking too much. So it, it it does a lot of things like that. I think probably what happened is I got ahead of it. Um, but because I'm not looking at it and and uh, so I was trying to follow its tempo but not doing a great job of it. But anyhow, as an app goes to get that feedback, how well you did, it's, it's unbelievable that this is possible now. Now, the flip side of this is I don't think I should be relying on an app to tell me if I did well. Um, yeah, so sit, sit around table site reading. Yeah, you, you want to do that. I, I want to be able to. Um, so, yeah, Margie, that's that is a great experience to be singing in a group and sight reading, because then you're having to, like, pay attention to yourself and not be thrown off by everyone else, but see what you can get from everyone else doing their parts as well. That's a its own amazing challenge. So the thing is, I don't want to have to rely on an app to tell me if I got things right or wrong or not. What I want to do, like, I'm going to flip to one that's too hard for me. And figure out for myself what I'm going to be doing wrong. So like, I need to find one that's maybe too hard for me. I'll try this one. Now, these are, these are just not that hard. Well, this one, this one, this one, especially with my voice. I could have been wrong about that, but I'm not. Bum, bum, bum. Ba da 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 dum, bum, ba da dum. So I think I nailed that one. But I easily could have been off on that A. And I put my ear to the test listening to myself. Did it sound like I was on Ray? Or, okay, so I personally use uh, Do based minor myself when I think about this. To me, this is Do, May, Sol. Do, ti, do, re, me, fa, sol, fa, me, uh, sol, re. But other people use la based minor, right? So this is la, do, mi, la, and then this is si, la, uh, ti, do, re, mi. I have to think a lot to use uh, la based minor. It doesn't come as naturally to me. Um, but solfege in general doesn't come naturally to me. I'm much more comfortable with numbers if I'm going to sing anything. One, three, five. One, seven, one, two, three, four, five. Four, three, five, two. So no matter whether I call this thing T or Ray or two, I, I want to make sure that I'm one step above that tonic. And so I'm going to check myself on things like that by listening to myself, sometimes stopping where necessary. So when I talk about not being totally enamored with the idea of using an app to tell me when I got it wrong, you know, it's amazing. It is fantastic by all means. It's a game changer, I'm sure. But there's something to be said for just being able to check for yourself also. So, all right. So Jim, was your okay? Uh, you're willing to come up here? Well, I'm going to invite you one way or the other. So, uh, and I know you've been just practicing this stuff and you, and, uh, You'd be able to also talk about Anki if you want, or however we pronounce that. If anyone else wants to come up and uh, participate on screen, now's a fine time to put in your volunteering. Uh, but, you know, whatever. I'm going to jump back in uh, in the book to closer to the beginning. And so I'm wondering, like, how many of you have tried this? How many of you have been, uh, <coughs> excuse me, how many of you have been trying these sight singing exercises? I know a couple of people have posted about it. And where for you uh, are you finding 
the break. Ah, uh, Jim. Okay, cool. Uh, Margie also. Great. So Margie, I'm going to invite you on stage as well. Come over here. And there's Margie. Yay. Invite to co-host. All right. So, so Margie, hopefully you'll see a little notification shortly. Um, and Allison, uh, so video doesn't matter if video's on or not, but uh, um, audio obviously will be quite useful. So I'm going to move this over here. And I'm going to bring Allison invite as well. And, uh, oh, but I that, that was a mistake because Margie, is that you there with the mic off? I still don't hear you though. Are you recording me? <laughs> oh, oh, um, okay. So yes, this is recorded and this does get posted. So if that changes oh. your mind at all about uh, this, I mean, it only gets shared within the community okay. here. But uh, um, if that if that makes you more uh, not wanting to, uh, you know, not not want to participate, that's fine too. But by all means, participate in it as a discussion if you're not comfortable with singing. Well, you can kick me off the stage if you want to, if I can't do it. So. Oh, oh, that's one thing I was wondering. So, yeah, I was under the impression that supposedly somewhere at the bottom of the screen, you should see a button that says leave stage or something like that. Is that, is that not the case? Uh, mm, no, I just say leave. I just see leave meeting. Yeah, and that's not uh, that's not what you want. Okay, so, well, I won't check that. Though. Okay, would I'll you like me to? Would, would you would it. you like me to uh, push you off? No, no, I'll be okay. Okay, and I then just you have can a just... little throat thing going on too. So, but all I'll right, okay. well, join the club then. <laughs> all right, Allison, how are you doing? Oh, I think not too bad, but um, yeah. I can't mute my mic because it's attached to me headphones. Okay, not a problem. I can actually mute. You, I think, where necessary, but then I don't know that I can unmute you later. And I'm going to sneeze in a minute, and it's going to be loud. So <laughs> I, I should mute myself. Okay, hold on. John, I'm on. I'm Is it on. coming? All right. Me. So anyhow, uh, let's try this. So Margie, how are you feeling about um? Uh, like your sight singing and Allison, I know you must probably be feeling pretty confident about your own sight singing. Well, I'm pretty, I'm good. I'm good at it. Yeah. That's Margie. Yeah. Okay. I got into solo cantorum on sight reading ability only. Ah, nice. <laughs> okay. I so red, I acquired the red ribbon through the RSCM, the World nice. Church Music but nice so so i don't expect that i'm going to be giving you like feedback on here's what you did wrong and here's how you can do better but i would love it if like um if we take say this example right here number 38 and what i'm going to do is uh um <clears throat> ask everyone who's here to look at it and sight sing it together but those of you who are are here on stage with me Either mute yourselves or Allison, uh, just just don't sing it. Just think it, okay? Because uh, I want I want everyone to be not hearing anything except themselves. So, uh, um, and then we're gonna have you two sing it, okay? And I don't know if how how well the synchronization is gonna go, but uh, we'll find out. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you pitch references here. First, I'm going to give you B flat because that is our key. And I'm going to give us a B flat scale. And feel free to sing along here. Yeah, my voices. Okay. Um, another thing I like to do is sing the tonic triad. Do, mi, sol, do, sol, mi, do. And yeah, synchronization wise, right, we'll be all over the place because that's the wonders of the internet for us, um, which is why I'm not going to have people try to do it together. But now let's walk up to the soul. Do, re, mi, fa, sol is our first note. So I want everyone to like uh, do that with me, uh, everyone who's listening at home. Do, re, mi, fa, sol. And sol is our first note. 
So now uh, Margie and Allison don't sing or sing muted. Everyone else sing. And then we're going to let uh, Margie and Allison, I'll see if we can get the two of them together. I don't know if that's going to work or not, but we'll find out. So I'm going to count to four. And I want everyone except Margie and Allison to sing in the privacy of your own homes. One, two, three, four. Okay, so my question for uh, those of you who were uh, singing, you know, how well do you think you did on that melody? And were there any spots that gave you a, that gave you a trouble? Now, what I should have done was muted myself and sang, but I didn't. And I'm going to tell you that for me, that was a little bit of an interesting learning experience because I realized when I got here to this uh, E flat at the end of the fourth bar, that I was wrong in my head. I was hearing the notes wrong. I jumped down after this A down all the way to an F here instead of an instead of a G. In my mind's ear, I was hearing an F, and then I realized that by the time I got here and realized that I was hearing D to C instead of E flat uh, to D, which is kind of interesting. That uh, you know, even without hearing it, I recognized that I that I had made a mistake in there. Okay, so uh, um, Margie and Allison, do you want to? I want to try this together. I want to see if the delay between the two of you is um, consistent enough mm. that you can sing together, even if you're not with me. I don't know if that that's going to work, but we're going to find out. Okay. So I'm going to count to four, and then I want the two of you to sing it in unison. And if it's obvious chaos, I'll just cut you off. Okay. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm going to count to four, and then the two of you try to sing it together. One, two, three, four. Okay, I'm going to stop you because, yeah, the synchronization isn't happening. It's, it's too confusing. So we're going to take turns. We're going to take turns. First line, Allison. Second line, Margie. Okay. okay. So first line will be Allison. Second line, uh, wh whatever I said. Did I say Allison first, then Margie? Hmm. Whatever yeah. I said, that, that's what we're going to do. Okay, so here we go. I'll count to four, and you just start singing, and then Margie, you'll come in when, you, when it's your turn, okay? One, two, three, four. No, no, no. I got too high. Sorry. Uh, no, but this, but this is great. So here's the thing. It's we can talk about what didn't what worked or didn't work as well. Um, Margie, you had a harder job here in that you had to come in on a note that you hadn't like prepared to come in on at all. Yeah. And and that half note, the first line, wasn't on pitch, so I was trying to go down from that and grab the C, and I think I sort of did it, but not real good at it. So gotcha. And that's those two E's. Those two E's. It's hard to hit the same note twice. And you were yeah. saying that, weren't you? Yeah. So Allison, yeah, I would say that the first that like this eighth note E was probably sharp enough to be about an E natural. But then it was right, an E flat right. by the time you got here. Does that does that match your impression of how you did? Yeah. I mean, we'll have a recording. You could look at it later. And so this is an interesting thing. I think ba -da 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 is kind of more or less how it came out. Like this was a chromatic thing here. But by the time you got here, your voice corrected itself. And yeah. I think you found the E flat at that point. I think that when you look at it, 
the notes are so small, you've got a job to tell whether you've got an E or an F. Or... There is that too. So on my screen, it's nice and big right now. But what you're seeing is different from what I'm seeing. Uh, wh what you could do is try to pull this up on another computer so that or on another screen or something. I don't know. Are you looking at this on your phone now? No, no, no. Oh, okay, no. that would be that would we be don't impossible. Have a mobile phone. So, Mark, also, yes. I know when we're sight reading music. So, if you have like going from the first F to a G, that's a whole step. Whereas when you go from the F to the E, that's a half step. Yes. It's hard for singers to get that half step exactly right. It really is, right? The difference between whole steps and half steps, especially when we think about singing relative to the stuff that I talked about in my newsletter and that article about uh, the different intonation systems, uh -huh. half steps are and whole steps are actually different sizes from each other depending on where they are in the scale. The whole step at the beginning of a major scale is supposed to be a little bigger than the next whole step it, according to just intonation. And so people who are accustomed to singing in choirs that are using this explicitly will uh, have steps of different sizes that they're singing. And uh, yeah, and it, it can be very, it can just be difficult to sing these intervals really accurately. Um, based on that discussion, I'm also wanting, you know, people in the uh, chat. So Bob, you gave yourself a, a low grade. Uh, I want to do the same thing again right here uh, of letting everyone try it on their own and then letting uh, Allison and Margie demonstrate, but this time we'll flip them, okay? So here's the everyone gets to try it on their own version of it. Um, so now my question is, do I remember Do? Do. Yeah, okay, good. That skill of just remembering what key you're in and holding on to that is, is quite useful. So Do, Re, Mi, Fa, Sol. All right, so again, I want everyone at home to sing. I want Margie and Allison not to, unless you can turn off your mics, so that everyone at home gets a shot at this. And we'll actually give you two shots at it, and then we'll uh, then we'll bring on the uh, the uh, other people. So, and Jim is saying he's more accurate if he sings the syllables, and I I find that it only matters for me. Well, I'm going to come back to that thought, Jim. All right, um, let's sing. Uh, so I'm going to count to four, and I want everyone at home to sing along, and I want to not hear uh, anything in my headphones. So here we go. One, two, three, four. I, I uh, pulled my uh, volume down, so hopefully you couldn't hear me singing. We're going to do that same thing again. I want to give everyone another shot at it. Then I want to talk a little bit about the, the solfege thing, and then we're going to we're going to hear uh, hear other people. We're going to hear Allison and Margie again. So here we go again. One, one. Here's our do. Here's our do. There's our soul. One, two, three, four. Okay, so again, I would love it if people in the chat would kind of talk about your experience. Did you feel you did better? I mean, obviously now you've heard it sung, but having heard it sung just once and then hearing discussion and there being question about which notes were, were maybe a little off, it's, it's almost like your sight singing again, right? So I wanna hear how well you did. And now I wanna address what Jim said about syllables. Like I'm, I'm, so so about singing the syllables I, I do okay with it but when i mentioned that when i was singing this line here so let me tell you what i sang i sang ba -do -da -da -da, ba -do -do -da ba -do -do -da -da 
bottom. That's what I sang in my head mm -hmm. the first time. And it was, and I didn't know I was wrong until I got to bottom and I sang that note there. Mm -hmm. And I recognized mm -hmm. Bob was Ray. It was scale degree two and not scale degree three. Had I been singing solfege syllables, I might have caught that earlier. But instead, I was just like imagining myself. I wasn't singing at all. I was just imagining things as imagining sounds, and my imagination was off. But the solfege syllables can sometimes help me be a little more honest about this. The other time I've noticed this very specifically for me was uh, I was practicing uh, sight singing something the other night, and it had a leap from a soul to me, so me. That's a super common leap, and it's it is dealt with uh, in these exercises, not too far from here. And at some point in our ear training, we learn how to learn. Oh, this is what a major sixth sounds like. It sounds like my body lies over the ocean. Well, my body lies over the ocean, like every other song that anyone ever learns for major sixths is. Soul to me, that's also NBC. It's also you should take the A train. It's every song that anyone ever learns. What was that one? I thought I heard a, another song in there. Every song that anyone ever learns to learn what a major sixth sounds like is that leap from soul to me. And so if you get lucky and your major sixth that you're trying to sing is soul to me, that's going to help. Um, but knowing the solfege syllables is going to help you more if you have a leap of a major six that's not soul to me by using the solfege syllables to help you place where that note actually is that you're leaping up to. And so I, I found myself finding that useful. So anyhow, that's me. That's that's something uh, about how I find this. Um, uh, before I have you sing, Allison or Margie, any, any comments on what I was just uh, talking about there? Because I don't know, do you use solfege a lot? No, not at all. Margie? Are you muted, Margie, or did we lose you? Okay. Yeah, when I was okay. helping out in the grade school, that one of the, the music teachers using solfege, and I got a real good, a better appreciation for it working with the children. So Yeah. And he never picked a key for them to sing, and he just, just... played his melody and then let them sing, and then whoever had the majority... Uh, he picked the majority key, and then we tune it to that. Ah, uh, okay, yeah. And that... that really helped because sometimes you pitch those songs to high or low for the kids' voices. Right, right. So I thought that's... that was kind of cool. That is cool. And, in fact, one of the sight-reading books that we used, uh, one of the schools where I uh, taught, uh, the first several chapters didn't have staff lines at all. They just oh. drew note heads and solfege syllables uh, so that, and then you would, you know, not have any particular pitch reference and you just sang it, whatever, wherever was comfortable. Yeah. Um, because that's how that, the guy who wrote that book thought was going to be useful. And James is making an observation that matches my experience that, um, there's a certain amount of calculation of what is the solfege syllable that goes with that note and having to make that calculation while also thinking about the singing of it, that's like asking yourself to do two things at once. And so sometimes writing in the solfege syllables, I mean, some people would say that's cheating, but okay, so maybe you practice just saying solfege syllables as one exercise, so you get the practice doing that on the fly, but then separately practice uh, um, uh, singing from those syllables once you've written them out. Anyhow, let's uh, try to sing this. So this time, Margie, you're going to start, and then Allison, <laughs> you're going to pick up after four bars, okay? <laughs> Do, re, mi, fa, sol. And so now the two of you can sing one at a time that way. One, two, three, four. Do, 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 all right so my my uh impression is yeah well that went 
overall went uh, better. I, I think we ended pretty close to the right pitch there. And that's when, when I talk about um, how I test myself. And I mentioned that one place where I stopped to check, do I think I have the right pitch? I will also check my last note. And does it sound like I'm in the same key I started with in? And one check for that is to sing the whole thing again and see if it feels like I'm drifting. I would still say um, it felt like the ease uh, both in Margie and Allison were on the sharp side. And so now what I'm wondering is, is this because my ear is accustomed to equal temperament and that naturally a uh, fa might be sung a little sharper than a piano. Is this true? Well, the strings tend to oh, play no. flat slightly sharp anyway. So this is an area yeah. that I don't... Soprano parts I've sung, we've always come down on top of a note, so we tend to be on the higher side of the note. And I think you kind of get used to that after a while. And that keeps that helps keep everybody else more on pitch because if you go flat on that part, it can take down the whole... Like when I've sung four parts, it can take down everybody. So yeah. we always tend to have a raise your eyebrows you know, and land on it, don't go up to it. Yeah. yeah. So I think maybe I might say a tiny bit sharp. I think it also makes it more brighter. Yeah. Just and a I think bit. But I'm not talking about being super sharp, but just a tiny oh, bit. A, yeah. I need to hear the beat to keep things going, you know. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And I think in general, like the leading tone, I know is usually sung a little sharper than it is in, in equal temperament. At least that's something I think I remember having heard and that certain other half steps are typically a little sharper. Um, the, the That idea of uh, deliberately singing sharp because left to your own devices, most things are going to go flat. That's not exactly what you said, but that's, that is, that is basically the truth, right? That's the truth. That is, the, that is the truth. Um, if you let people sing without like, calling them on pitch at all and just sing for a while. Generally speaking, pitch is going to drift down. Most people tend to drift down in pitch. And so singers who are accustomed to fighting that deliberately push things a little sharper. And when you mentioned raising eyebrows, I had to smile at that because that's like, I remember this, it was sort of a joke, but you know, how, what's the difference between a uh, flat and sharp? Um, sing, uh, flat is what makes you go like this. And sharp and sharp is what makes you go like this. And just like how how you react with your body when you hear something that's flat, you kind of want to raise up in your seat to, to pull the pitch up. And when you hear someone singing sharp, you kind of want to scrunch down, to pull the pitch down. And that's just like this natural <laughs> thing, which leads also to what uh, uh, Jim and John are talking about here in the chat. Um, you know, do hand signals help? with the pitches. And I only learned those hand signals a couple of years ago. So I, I, anything I know about sight singing long predates the hand signals and uh, for the soulfish syllables. And so no, they don't help me one bit. Uh, and it's more of that calculation to have to do that messes me up. But working with it with students, I, I've, I've seen some marginal value to that. Uh, so same question for Al Allison and Margie while you're on here. Uh, do you have experience with that at all? Hand signals, um, the do, re, mi. No. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, and I think I, those hand signals are probably more used in the U.S. than the U.K., although I could be wrong about that. Yeah. But I, mean, I didn't you, hear you, do, re, mi until I saw Sound of Music. Huh? You, you could I was remember. about 16, I guess. I don't know, but. But I've been playing the piano and singing in groups till then, so I never really did any syllables. We just learned the lyrics or sang law. So gotcha. Yeah. You couldn't have a group singing in church waving their hands. Yeah, you know? that's that is true. <laughs> also, yeah, it's, yeah, it's more of a pedag and it's more of a pedagogical <laughs> tool than something you would use in performance. Yeah. Um, also, uh, and I'm going to play this uh, in a second, Helen. Um, but uh, I just want to mention that Jim mentions also about like fingering on the instrument, which is very similar to the idea of using hand signs. But also, you all know or have probably seen my paper keyboard, and I I, I do swear by fingering something as a way of helping me ascertain where that pitch is. I can't explain why it helps, but it does. So I'm going to play this melody now, and then, um, you know, 
uh, uh, we will uh, probably get going because this has been a good session, but my voice has had enough and we've been on uh, oh, oh, long enough here, but let me play that melody for us. I'll, you can try it, you can sing along with me. One, whoop. so what did I just sing? I don't even know what that note was. One, I just sang some random note. So, re, I mean, so, me, do. I gotta remember where do is. I've lost my do, right? Talking too much. Do, me, so. So I'm not gonna sing, I'm just gonna play. But you all sing with me. You all at home, not, not those of you on mic. One, two, three, four. So I just Jane. realized I sang on my E's. Yeah. They as a natural instead of a flat. Yeah, well that's and that's what I'm saying. This is where James has this amazing well, that's why I said it sounded like you were singing sharp, but and I was wondering if it was just yeah, singers we, take fa sharp. My brain is, yeah. Yeah, but James has this awesome observation in here that when you start this piece as far as the as far as your ear is concerned that melody could be an f and your mel you, your brain could be thinking about the key of f based on how that melody started and so your brain kind of wants that to be an e natural because you haven't heard enough context to tell you that it's not e flat i mean to tell you that it's not e natural if we had been hearing accompaniment you know ba, do, da, 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 ba, do, do. See, I just did the same thing. I just did the same wrong note. If I'm hearing accompaniment that makes it really clear I'm in the key of B flat, I'm much more likely to sing the E flat in pitch. But just based on those first two and a half measures, your brain could still be an F at that point. We haven't heard enough context to tell us otherwise. And so that has a big part of, of why you, your brain wants you to sing an E, other than not reading the key signature also, of course. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, I want to thank Allison and Margie for volunteering to uh, to help out here with the singing and the conversation. Love this. And, and yeah, overall, I, I want to be doing more of that sort of thing anyhow, but the, my voice today gave me the perfect excuse to do it. So I want to thank you both for being here. And Allison, you also don't see a leave stage button or anything like that? Because I, no. I, I don't know what it looks like from your end. No, just leave. Okay, so I'm just going to remove you as co-host so you will still be here but basically we're signing off so thank you again so much allison and margie and margie all right so um i want you now to be practicing sight singing on your own you know we got to look at one example in depth and at some point we're not sight singing it anymore but that's okay because a lot of the learning comes from that analysis what did i do wrong which is another reason why while i love the idea of ella that app i'm a little skeptical because i think that analysis how did i go wrong and figuring out what went well and what didn't based on your own perception evaluating your own performance, I think that is where a ton of the learning is. So uh, by all means, keep practicing this on your own, go through more of those examples and uh, just uh, work on this and I'll have some other things for you to work on. But by all means, we're gonna be doing more sight singing throughout here. We're gonna do more rhythmic stuff. I'll post some more exercises along that. Thanks again to Allison and Margie. Thanks to everyone for being here and being part of this. And um, yeah, I'm going to go home and get myself some chicken soup. And it's Thursday. I'm going to watch Picard. Uh, the last is episode 10, which is probably going to be a two-parter. But I'm looking forward to being able to watch that with some chicken soup in a little bit. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, make sure I'm not missing anything crucial in the chat here. Um, so uh, 
Thanks uh, so much. And Bob, yeah, I think I do know that I can get my phone to uh, display somehow. Uh, there's a couple different ways I can do that. Air server is one of them. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, uh, see you all next time.